it's great to see you. Tap your neighbor and say you look good this morning. It's great to see everybody. Glad you made it to the house of God. It's going to be a great Sunday. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Mark Francie, and you're at Ocean's Church, and we're going to have a good time. You wouldn't know by that response, but we're going to have a good time. It's all right. You made up your mind not to expect for anything. I already made up my mind. We're going to break through today. I don't like coming to church with no faith, no expectation. As far as I can tell, anytime God shows up, something can happen. It's the best place to be on a Sunday morning. If you believe it, say, oh, yeah. It's a faith-filled church, but I'm excited you're here today. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you after service. I'll try to sneak out there and, and talk to as many people as I can. But I do have a message I want to share with you today. I think God is moving in a significant way. I know it's an election year. I know that we're living in wild times. We got crazy, uh, we got crazy economics. We got crazy politics. Come on, when you know that the only place you can get gas under $5 is Taco Bell? Come on, you know that God needs to move. I'm telling you, it's going to be a good Sunday. If you believe it, say amen. There's something in the church that I think has, has the only hope to offer our world. I know there's no such thing as a perfect church, but I do think there's a church that's perfect for you. Churches have people in them. People have problems. Problems have churches. Come on. But I do know this, that when you're in the right place, you get closer to God. And the closer you get to God, it's, it's amazing how things start to shift. God starts turning the lights on in the dark areas of your life. I don't know about you. I don't need just more good things, more, uh, more toys, more, more trips, more, more stuff. I need more of God. Love what Julie said, that I want to go to a place that believes there is more of God to be had. And my hope this morning is that at Ocean's Church, you would show up every week like a pregnant woman. What do you mean, preacher, that you're not just eating for yourself? I want you coming so hungry for God that you're eating for two people. Can I get a witness? You got a brother and sister that's not in the room today? Come on, you need to eat some extra for them. We got to lean in a little bit more today. You hear me today? We're going to break through in this place. Didn't come for spiritual calisthenics and Christian karaoke. I think we need to have an encounter with God today. So if I preach a little bit intense, my wife says I get intense when I get fired up. She says my eyes get kind of like hyper-focused. I promise I love you, but I do want to make sure that we go after God and break through today. You guys ready? You have your Bibles this morning. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 25. We've been in a series called The Glorious Church. Our conviction is, is that Jesus Christ is not coming back at the end of the world with the world on fire and the church burnt down. I want you to know that when the world's on fire, there is a fire department called the church. I do believe the church is the hope of the world. I know churches are not working well. There could be a lot of, destru uh, a lot of dis destruction. There could be a lot of disappointment. There could be a lot of bitterness. But I do believe that when churches are being the people that God wants them to be, that there is nothing better on the earth given my life to see God's church built. And I want you to know today that the church is not a building, it's those that are in the building. You are the church. Come on, tap your neighbor and say, you're a good looking church. Got your Bibles today? If you're brand new to our church, I'm gonna open up to Matthew chapter 25. I'm gonna read 13 verses, 13 verses. It's an easy read, so don't freak out. It's gonna be an easy read today. And after we read those 13 verses, I'm gonna pray. The great scholar MC Hammer said, we have to pray just to, there's a few people over 40. If you do the rest of that song, schedule a colonoscopy, okay? <clears throat> but listen, <clears throat> we are, uh, we're going to read Matthew chapter 25. I, uh, I think it's important this morning, uh, you know, eschatology is the study of end times. And Matthew 24, Matthew 25 is where we get a lot of our end times discourse, our doctrine. And a uh, very famous story of Matthew 25 is about Jesus talking about 10 virgins, 10, 10 virgins that are, that are actually getting ready to meet the groom. And it's actually a story, it's a parable. Someone say parable. If you don't know what a parable is, a parable is when Jesus actually talks about something that everybody knew about to explain something that everybody wondered about. That was a parable. He would take what we know to explain what we wonder about. And that's the story of Matthew 25 we're going to read this morning. And uh, I, I want to let you know that our church is turning six years old this week. <laughs> Technically, we turned six last week, but we pushed it back a week. And um, it's amazing that it's been six years. It feels like yesterday that we started this church. It's me, my wife, a U-Haul, come on. Two little girls, eight people that moved down here from Idaho, didn't know anybody in Orange County. And to watch what God has done, over 10,000 people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ. Come on, isn't that awesome? This church has been a part of baptizing over 16,000 people in 16 months. God is moving. It's undeniable. 
But I want you to know today that as, as we celebrate our anniversary week, that the best is coming. I think we haven't seen nothing yet. I think God will do more in 12 months than we did in six years. I think that from this point forward, we're going to see exponential multiplication. I do believe that we're getting ready to enter into a season of extra. Come on, tap your neighbor say extra. Come on, tap your neighbor say extra, extra. I know it's a little bit cheesy, but I do think that there is something about this next window of our life that we need to believe God for extra. This is not a financial message. This is a faith message. I think that we live in a world that is lacking, that is empty. I was going to title this message this morning from empty to extra. But we'll keep it short, so we'll just call it extra. Is that all right? Matthew chapter 25. You guys ready to go? <clears throat> Who believes we're getting closer to the end of the, end of the world? Yeah. You look outside. I know 2020, everyone thought it was, the world was going to collapse. We're getting closer to the end. When the news starts almost becoming transferable with your Bible, we know we're getting closer to the end. I'm reading the Bible, I'm watching the news, I'm watching the news, I'm reading the Bible, and I'm like, whoa, they're almost the same. We're getting closer to the end. In my line of work, people ask me, preacher, do you think that we're getting close to the end of the age? Uh, my answer is always the same. We are at least 24 hours closer than we were this time yesterday. <laughs> Wise man said that we gotta, we gotta plan like Jesus is not coming back in our lifetime, but we gotta live like he could come back at any moment. Appreciate the four people in here that are excited to be at church this morning. I went to Brian Regan last night at the Seegerstrom. He's, he's a clean comedian, one of my favorites. And I was shocked at how excited everybody was. They were clapping before he came on. He, they were cheering that he'd come back. I was like, I should have been a comedian. <laughs> People showed up early. They wanted to stay late. No one complained if it went long. Ocean's Church will not be outdone by comedy clubs. Come on, I need you to wake up this morning. I said we're not going to be outdone by comedy clubs. We're not going to be outdone by the Lakers. We're not going to be outdone by the Rams. I wish you'd get up on your seat like you just got a first down, like we are winning the Super Bowl. We're celebrating the fact that we serve a God that's alive, a God that heals, a God that restores. I wish you'd get up on your feet. Give God 20 seconds. I need everybody to stand up. Come on, we're going to honor the King. We're going to honor the king. Come on. We're going to honor the king. We're not honoring a man. We're honoring the king. We're not honoring a preacher. We're honoring. Come on. 20 seconds of your best praise. Let's go. Hey. Got to break through that religious spirit. Can't stand that religious spirit. Gets more excited for sports than God. How dare you? They're entertaining you. God is saving you. We're going to give God our best. Everyone shout amen. amen. Grab a seat. Matthew 25, let's read this this morning. Jesus talking, it's eschatology. It's a study of end things, end times. He says this in Matthew chapter 25. This is not a literal story. It's a, it's a parable. It's, a, it's an analogy. It's a metaphor. He says the kingdom of heaven is like, it's like in the ten virgins. How many? Who took their lamps. They all had lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five were wise, five were foolish. How many were wise? Five. How many were foolish? Five. So for every wise, there was a fool. For every foolish person, there was a wise person. You could say that there 50% of the Christians were wise. 50% were foolish, mathematically speaking. Now, five of them were wise, five were foolish. Now, those that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil. Someone say, no oil. They took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels, with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, someone say delayed. delayed. While there was a delay, everybody fell asleep. It's interesting that the wise slept with the foolish. The foolish were asleep like the wise. Everybody was asleep. But at midnight, someone say midnight. midnight. It was the middle of the night. It was an inopportune time. No one was expecting it. Someone cried aloud. A cry was heard. And it said, behold, the bridegroom is coming. He's coming. Who believes that he's coming? Who believes that one day Jesus Christ is coming back? He's coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Give us some of your oil. For our lamps are burning out. The end of the age, we're going to have people that are burning out. They said, we're burning out. Give us some of your oil. But the wise answered saying, someone say, no. 
reason why some of you are burning out is you don't know how to tell people no. The wise said no. No, lest there not be enough for me, for us, but you. Someone say you. Get your preacher finger out. Get your preacher finger out. Point at somebody. Say you. But rather you go get some oil for yourself. Go buy your own oil. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, key word here, ready. This whole passage is about being ready. Who's ready this morning? They were ready. They went with him into the wedding. And the door was shut. The door was shut. I hate showing up to places when the door is shut. Nothing worse than missing an opportunity when the door is shut. The door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he answered and said, surely I say to you, I do not know you. The word know there is not the word like, I don't know who you are. It's the intimate word that I don't intimately know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day or the hour which the Son of Man is coming. I don't know when he's coming back, if it'll happen in my lifetime. Grandma was a preacher. She used to always say, I pray the upper taker comes before the undertaker. I don't know if he's coming before or after my life, but I'm going to live ready. Anybody else want to live ready? You guys ready? To go? I feel like preaching in the service today, man. I'm, I'm ready to get after it. Come on, give me, 20, give me 25 minutes. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you to meet us here today. I thank you that whether we're atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Muslim, I pray, Lord, whether we've never been to church our whole life, I pray whether we're super jaded, God, if we're in a bitter place, a negative place, if we're an addict, God, if we're, if we're in, in addiction and bondage, I thank you that Jesus Christ, you are the Lord. I thank you today that the good news is good. The good news is so good that it liberates the addict, it actually heals the sick, it releases the captive. So Lord, I pray right now an anointing from heaven to break every single yoke in Jesus' name. We believe for extra. If you believe it, come on, say amen. amen. I'm like you, I'm a pretty normal person. I, I, I hate running out of stuff. I don't know if there's a worse feeling in the world that you pour a bowl of your favorite cereal to only find that there is three drops of milk left. I hate running out. I don't like being on a road trip and you run out of gas. Remember I had an electric vehicle. It said I could go 300 miles. The devil is a liar. First time riding a Tesla, they said 300 miles on a charge. I'm like, yeah, right, 30 miles on the freeway. It's crazy that there's, there's something about running out that drives everybody crazy. I don't know if you've ever bought a bunch of meat. Come on, where's my, where's my carnivore people at? I'm a vegetarian. You're eating the animal's food then. <laughs> Another story. Bought a bunch of meat and you start grilling and you find out that your propane tank runs out. It's the worst. I've been there, you're like mid-cook and all of a sudden just the flames go out. I know all those Traeger owners are judging me right now. I feel the judgment. You mention a propane grill and all the Traeger people start coming out like, this guy. I hate running out of stuff. I don't like running out of propane when I'm grilling. I don't like running out of milk when I got cereal. I don't like running out of ketchup. A1 sauce. Come on, I'm 40 years old. I appreciate Sizzler. When I got married, Rochelle had to refine me and say, Mark, you don't ask for A1 sauce at a good steakhouse. I said, we ask for A1 all the time at Sizzler. It's crazy. My dad, we run out of A1 sauce. He'd say, put some water in it and shake it up. Don't let, the, don't let the suit fool you. Come on, somebody. We grew up Poe. Our welcome mat just said, well. I don't like running out of things. I texted some of our staff pastors this morning. I said, I'm, I'm thinking about talking about running out in the message today. What do you hate running out of? And it's funny that Pastor Joel said sunscreen. He just got burned at San Juan from our LED wall. Happens every week. We got some olive oil for him. We love Pastor Joel. Maybe the worst thing to run out of is toilet paper. Who's ever committed? Come on. You're already, come on, you're committed and you're like, wow, we're out of toilet paper. First of all, I know some of you aren't because I know what happened during COVID. Some of you are still stocked up. I'm still a little bit angry at some of you guys. 
Took me six months to get toilet paper. I hate running out of toilet paper. There's something about running out that just drives you crazy. I love having extra. I'm an American. Come on, we like extra. Sometimes I don't like going to nice restaurants because when they don't have prices on the menu, the food is delicious, but there's three bites. So I have to factor into my budget not only how much that meal is going to cost, but also stopping it in and out on the way home because I'm still hungry. Who's ever had to eat after eating? Come on. So you can keep your fancy food. I want a full stomach. I want extra. Someone say extra. It's interesting that there was five wise, five foolish. They all started with the same dresses. They all started with lamps. They were all equal. I believe all of us as believers are equal at the foot of the cross. Jesus Christ, his grace, his mercy, it saves us. It actually redeems us. He buys us back. He, he removes the, the, the authority of sickness, death, and hell in the grave. There is something good that happens when we receive Jesus. There is a level playing field. But it's wild that they all started in the same place. And it's interesting that, that all of them, they, they started with the same, but there was five that were defined as wise. Five that were labeled foolish. And the only difference was one had extra and one did not have extra. Here's what I believe, Ocean's Church, that the closer we get to the coming of the Son of Man, there will be a great awakening. We know that it says this, that they all went to sleep, which honestly, it worries me as a pastor, as a preacher, that there is very, it's, it is possible to have a full oil lamp and still go to sleep. I don't want to sleep with my oil. They all fell asleep. Those that were wise fell asleep. Those that were foolish fell asleep. I think it's easy to be in a great church and stay asleep. I think it's possible to follow Jesus Christ and go to sleep. People say, Mark, I wouldn't be sleeping if my leader was a better leader. No, Jesus had 12 and one out of the 12 went to sleep. It is possible to be following Jesus Christ himself. Be asleep. We got a world that's tired of sleepy Christians. Sleepy Christians are mean. Sleepy Christians are critical. Sleepy Christians, they know all the right things, but they don't live the right things. I don't want to be a person that knows it, but doesn't live it. I want my light to so shine. Jesus said that we're called to be a city on a hill. We don't light lamps and put them under baskets. We put them up until the whole house has light. We know that there was five wise, five foolish. The only difference was extra. It was extra that separated them. And here's what I know, the closer we get to Jesus coming back, the more people are going to wake up. Here's a challenge to the church. When people are awakened, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for the people that have extra oil. They don't care about extra programs. We got a lot of people bragging about how gifted they are. That's a lamp. How, how much money they have, that's a lamp. How many facilities they own, that's a lamp. You can have all those things all day long. We got greater Bible teaching. We got greater songs, singers, media, technology. That is all lamps. My concern is today we have lamps, but we're lacking oil. We got more lamps than the world has ever had before. We got more lanterns than Dana Point. Come on. We got tons of lanterns, but we have no oil. Where are the churches that have oil? Where are the Christians that have oil? I'm telling you, the gifts of God are irrevocable. I don't care how gifted you are. Giftedness does not reveal, reveal godliness. That's a big mistake people make is they think because you're gifted, you must be godly. People follow sometimes people that are gifted that aren't godly. And they get mad at the church when those gifted people fall because they were never godly to begin with. Don't mistake God's, his patience with God's approval. I see people that, that were elevated in a season that everybody followed them, but they weren't godly, they were gifted. I don't want to be a gifted church, I want to be a godly church. I appreciate the 14 people that are with me today. I'm going to keep preaching this thing how I feel it though. Someone say extra. There were some foolish people, they did not have extra. They didn't have it. The Bible says in the end time, 2 Timothy 3 says that there's going to be traitors, headstrong people, people that love money, love pressure, lo lovers of everything, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, denying its oil, denying its extra. I think that one of the qualities of the end days church is there won't just be wisdom, there'll be power. I'm not just going to church because they have good morals. I go to a cult and find some good morals. 
Well, there's some good community. I can go to a, I can go to a, a country club and get some good community. This is more than community. Dear God, help us. I'm sorry, but there's people that have reduced the church down to good community and moral morality. We are not moralist. Yes, the Holy Spirit will make you holy. Yes, you are whole when you are holy. And we have a lot of people that don't want to be holy because they don't realize that it's being holy that makes you whole. W-H-O-L-E, like whole paycheck, whole foods. Extra. I don't want to be unprepared. I don't want to burn out. I don't want to miss my window and end up at a closed door. Listen to me, if you're gonna to go to Ocean's Church, I know some of you will be with us for maybe six months. Some might be here for seven days. Some might be with us for seven years. Maybe you'll be with us for the next 40 years of your life. I don't know how much time we have together, but I have a commitment to make to you that this church will never apologize, number one, for being a church that has oil. You one of those churches that believe that God still speaks? Absolutely. You think the Bible's still real today? Absolutely. You think that God still does miracles today? Absolutely. And I'm not apologizing, dumbing it down, because your eight-pound brain can't fathom the deep things of God. Well, I don't really believe that. I went to cemetery, and I got taught how God's not really real anymore. Listen to me. The man with an education is, is never going to be uh, discouraging a person that's had a God encounter and experience. I've seen God do miracles. I've seen things that my brain does not understand. I've seen God speak to me in ways that were beyond my intellect. I've seen God give me solutions to problems I should have never had. God's enabled me to do things I should have never done. I know my Redeemer lives. Are you going to talk me out of it? Well, my pastor said that miracles don't happen anymore. Not in his church. Well, the Christian school I went to says that you can't talk like that anymore. Yeah, not in that school. My daughter was going to a school that her friend talked about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit healing her dad, and she was asked not to talk at that school again. It's right over here. It's a Christian school. And I'm thinking, man, it's all right. God bless you. You're going to go to heaven, but you're going to miss out on what heaven could have done in your life on earth. I'm not apologizing for the oil. Well, I went to Ocean's Church, and three different people prayed for me, and the third one, when they prayed, I got instantly healed. That was our my story today. I'm not apologizing going to a church that's got some oil. Can I get a good amen? Who wants to go to an oily church? Anybody want to go to an oily church? It's kind of wild, man. I'll take some wildfire over no fire. Well, if I don't understand everything, I'm not going to really engage. Then you're not going to engage. It says that we walk by faith, not by sight. And FYI, faith is not the absence of logic. Sometimes God will ask you to do something that transcends your logic. But ultimately, James says if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God in faith. So we see here that faith and wisdom often work together. People say, what do you need extra of, Mark? Well, according to Matthew chapter 25, we need extra, number one, oil. The only difference between the wise and the foolish was one had oil, one didn't. And when there's a great awakening in the end days, and we start baptizing not only California, but June 8th, we baptize America. And from June 8th, we motivate the world to say, if God can do this in America, he can do baptize Africa, he can do baptize Europe, he can do baptize South America. You're crazy, preacher. You better believe I'm crazy. I'm crazy enough to believe that God does what he says. Matthew 28 says to go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Maybe there's something in this baptism movement that's a part of the Great Commission. Why is California special? I think it's special because we are the opposite side, almost identical opposite side from the holy place in Jerusalem. If you were to go both ways the same direction, it's equal to Orange County. Do you know what Orange County is? Why it's special here, I think? Because it represents the Great Commission, the ends of the earth. He says when this gospel goes to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. We're closer to the end right now, ladies and gentlemen. And if you study church history, if you haven't, I'll inform you. The greatest moves of God in the last hundred years have happened in this state. You one of those guys think we're better than everybody else? No. But I'm not going to deny what God is doing. And by the way, I don't think God does great things in our lives so we can brag about them. I think to whom much is given, much is required. If God is pouring out his spirit in California, we're not going to hide it here. 
We're not going to light our lamps and put them under a bushel. We're going to pull that bushel up. We're going to shine for the world to see. Come on, if you believe that God can do it, say amen. I don't want to be unprepared. I want to have oil. Someone say oil. The oil was given originally for free, but when they ran out of oil or they didn't get oil, they had to go and pay a price. I do believe that if you want to be anointed, it's different than being saved. Being saved is free. Being anointed will cost you your life. We had a bunch of Christians that are saved, but they're not anointed. Anointed people are like Acts chapter 4, that when you talk, people go, this guy's untrained. This guy's an idiot. But I can also tell that he's been with Jesus. I hope they say that about me. Because that's what they said about the original followers of Jesus Christ. I've heard some of the, of the smartest men alive right now at the end of their lives saying, if you were to talk to young preachers coming up, what would you tell them? Is he said three things. He said, I would tell them to read your Bible, to love to pray, and to, to value those two things and love the people. If you love the word, if you love to pray, and you love the people, you'll have the anointing. We got people that worship education, they have no anointing. They don't have prayer lives, they have study closets. I want a prayer closet, not a study closet. Get quiet up in this Presbyterian church today. I'm going to keep preaching this thing, though. No. Someone say oil. Oil is what separated the wise from the foolish. And here's what I want to tell you about the oil of God. It's the Holy Spirit. The oil is produced in the presence of God. You know why you leave this room, you feel better about life? Even sometimes when your problems are the exact same, it's because you got some oil transferred onto you. Something better than connecting to the Wi-Fi is connecting to the Spirit of God. And when you get connected to the Spirit of God, His oil begins to flow into you. You know His oil by peace. Like you know the devil by confusion. When the devil shows up, you feel confused. FYI, confusion is not a fruit of the Spirit. People say, I think I'm leaving the church. I feel confused. Well, that's not God. And don't ever make long-term decisions when you're confused. I want to make decisions out of faith and clarity, not confusion. People say, Mark, you don't understand. I'm just confused right now. The Bible says that in his presence is the fullness of what? Joy. He's the God of peace. He's the prince of He's the, he's the author of peace. He's Je Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Most people don't have oil because they don't realize oil is manufactured in the presence of God. And I want to be very clear today, Oceans, that we will not apologize for the next 40, 60, 80 years for being a church that has oil. Do you know why we pray Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m.? Because we want to have oil. Do you know why our staff is going after God, praying for you all week long? Because we want to be a church that has... Do you know why we meet with people one-on-one? -on -one? Because we want to be a church that has... Come on. Do you know why we worship the way that we do? Because we want to have... Do you know why we lift our hands, we clap, we shout, sometimes we jump, we, sh we sing? Because we want to go after God because we're experiencing his oil. People that are going after God don't care about what people think about them. I am completely immune to what you think about me when I'm going after Jesus. That guy, at the end of the service, he'll walk around, close his eyes, does this weird thing with his arms, kind of raise his hands like this. What's he doing? I don't care what you think. I know what you need. It's funny. We would argue maybe. Maybe we would disagree on what we do in church. But I think that we would agree on what we want at the end of it. We want Jesus to show up. We want Jesus to do today what he did then. So you might disagree on how we get there, but in my opinion, the oil flows where God is present. And God is present where he is worshiped. God is, God is present where he is magnified. Do you know why I made you get up off your seats? Because if your favorite dignitary walked in here, you would give him a standing ovation. If your favorite athlete walked in the room and scored a touchdown, you would stand to your feet. If you went to your favorite movie premiere and you met your favorite celebrity, you would get up and be excited to meet him. So why in the world? Honor is what unlocks the oil. And most churches don't have oil because they don't have honor. Why do we honor politicians but we don't honor Jesus Christ? I mentioned this last, last week, two weeks ago. I got to go to this thing. Someone gave me a free ticket to a $100,000 uh, a plate fundraiser for one of the presidents in Beverly Hills. I show up for free. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Favor ain't fair. I get there. I'm looking around. These people are worshiping this, this leader. Now, whether you love him, whether you hate this person, that's your prerogative. But the fact that someone would be willing to honor someone that high, that I would give you a hundred grand for an hour of listening to you talk. Some of you would go to church and not hear God talk. 
because you wouldn't give him the honor that he deserves. Do you know why the person next to you might get healed today and you'll leave here with a bad attitude? It wasn't because God wasn't here. It was because you had no honor. The oil, are you hearing me? I feel like preaching in Orange County a little bit. I know I'm kicking some sacred cows, but I'm from Idaho. We like cow tiffin. You got to have honor. Honor is what unlocks the anointing. And it's the oil of God that breaks every yoke. I don't want to burn out. I'm telling you right now that a lantern without oil leads to a closed door. Hear me today. A lantern without oil leads to a closed door eventually. Truth is, some, some of you don't even realize this. There is not only oil that you can have extra of, but if you're going to have that extra oil, you're going to have extra expectation. Write that down. These five were ready. They were expecting him. So even though they were sleeping, they were sleeping with some oil. And I'm telling you right now, if you're going to fall asleep, you better make sure you got some oil. Because no man knows the day or the hour that Christ returns. Foolish people are not ready. Foolish people are not prepared for the king's return. I'm telling you that if you wait till Jesus returns, it's going to be too late. This is not a left behind message. Come on, Kirk Cameron. This ain't that. I don't believe in that left behind theology. That theology is only about 100 years old. I believe that literally Jesus Christ will return one day. The sky will split. Those that are dead in Christ will rise. And I'm going to tell you right now that we're going to hear a trumpet. It's going to be a mighty trumpet. We're going to see an army of angels. We're going to see our king on a horse with hair like wool, eyes like fire. And you're going to watch him give the devil the worst day the guy's ever seen in his life. It's going to happen. But if you wait for the king to return to get your oil ready, it's too late. I don't want to live with an empty lamp today. I want to get filled up. I want to go to a church that's full. I want to be a part of a marriage that's full. I want to have a heart that's full. Are you hearing me today? I want to live full with extra, not empty. Come on, if you believe it, say amen. amen. I'm telling you, too many of you are wasting time, wasting potential. They're sleeping. You know, you're a sleepy Christian when you complain about everything. You're critical about everything. You gossip about everything. I have found that the biggest gossips are the bored people in life. I don't have time and energy to gossip. Brian Regan had a brilliant joke last night. I remember the other guy did. He said that uh, he had an alarm clock idea for his wife, his ex-girlfriend. That's what he said. My ex-girlfriend. He said, I had an alarm clock idea. He said, nothing would get her out of bed faster than gossip. He said, one of your friends got arrested last night. He said, my girlfriend would have woke up right away because she was hungry and thirsty for gossip. Do you know why so many people in Orange County have gossip? Because they're bored spiritually. I have found that those that are rowing don't complain about the speed of the ship. It's those that are eating, eating popcorn, looking around, talking about the music's not loud enough. They didn't sing my song. I don't know if I like this church. This guy shouldn't be wearing a suit today. What's up with those loafers? Why are you so critical? problem is you're a sleepy Christian. You'd rather complain about what you don't like than celebrate what we do have. I'm always shocked. There was a lady that went to this church in the early days. Her husband didn't know God her whole marriage. They're like in their 60s and their 70s. He hated God. He hated the church. He ends up coming to our church. 40 people invited him to our church. He started loving our church. I started meeting with this guy. I'm discipling this guy. I'm this close to like getting this guy into the kingdom. And then the wife gets offended. Offended over the stupid, I won't even tell you what it was. It was so ridiculous what she got upset about. She got upset about something that happened five years ago, before we were even pastors, about something in our church, before it was a church. And I thought you were willing to cash in how close your husband was. How much has God done in your family? How much has God done in your life through this church? And you would get mad because we didn't play your My Story video? Isn't it because you had to walk for 70 seconds to get a parking spot to the church? It's funny that people that are sleepy will complain over stupid stuff. Is this too real today? The problem with potential is, is these foolish virgins, they had potential, but they weren't prepared. And I want, I'll be very honest with you that potential without preparation will always lead to frustration. The most frustrated people I meet, the most bitter people I meet, are those that have crazy potential, but they're not even prepared. They're not ready. They got lamps that are beautiful, but they got no oil in those lamps. You got money, but you don't have meaning. You got a job, but you don't have a calling. 
You're making a living, but you're not making a difference. I can do it all day long. I've got all these little preacher one-liners stuck in my head. <laughs> Why am I so miserable? Because you have potential, but you don't have preparation. I'm telling you right now, I don't waste so much time that you finally get serious and the door is closed. Are you foolish? Theologically speaking, let's ask the question, a hard question to ask. But I've learned this. The good news is if you are foolish today, if you're not full of oil, if you're not honoring the Spirit of God, if you're not living every day for His presence and in His presence, the good news is, is sometimes wisdom comes from the foolish things that we do that we learn from. Amen. Amen. Having a long-term, uh, ha having a lantern with no oil means that you're always going to be dependent on God to show up during the daytime. Do you know why most Christians are immature? Because they're relying on God to show up when life is good. I think the story is this, is that Jesus will return one day, and it might not be daytime. It's probably not going to be daytime. Which leads us to our last, last point today, is that we got to have extra oil, extra expectation, because if we don't, we're going to miss our opportunities. There are extra, listen to me, Oceans Church, opportunities that will come if we're full of oil and we're full of expectation. Problem is, is it says they showed up, he showed up at night, and your, your lamp is only good if it's daytime, if you don't have oil. And I think there's many Christians that are relying on God to show up in their life during the day because they don't have access to the oil. You need oil at nighttime. If you don't have oil at night, your light will burn out. And I think that Exodus chapter 3 is a story of what Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to be on fire, not burning out, with God's voice coming through us. That's what I want to do. I'm not going to preach on fire today because last time I did that, this place caught fire. I'm just kidding. I'm not taking credit for that. But I will say that we are supposed to be on fire, not burning out, with God's voice coming out of us. Still with me today. Opportunities. Foolish look for the wise as their source. And I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that you learn from the Bible here is that rather than the foolish, it's interesting. I, I did a deep dive of this. If you go even back a couple verses, before they asked for oil, they actually trimmed their wicks. They were so confident that they were going to get the oil from the wise that they never took the time to go get their own oil. And I just thought, isn't it funny that foolish people will leech off of wise people? For every wise, there's a foolish. Isn't it crazy? And I'll write, be, write, be honest with you, you can't feel guilty for the people that are drawn to you because you're full and they're empty. The biggest mistake I've seen with immature Christians is they get a savior complex. They think because I'm full of oil and empty people are drawn to me, I have to save them. I have found the worst thing you can do for people is be their savior. I'm actually a very terrible savior. Jesus Christ is amazing at saving. I'm terrible at saving. Immi immature Christians love the way it feels when people come to you for the prophetic word. And they come to you for prayer and come to you for all your needs. I am not Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm happy to pray. I'm happy to counsel. But if you don't listen to that counsel, you got to get some of your own oil. Problem is, if you're wasting your oil, you'll waste my oil too. I don't want to be a church that wastes our oil. Can I get an amen? And here's the message for the church today, is you got to go get your own oil. Salvation is free. The anointing costs you something. And the saddest part of the story was, is they didn't have extra oil. I think that the saddest thing that happens to churches is that people show up hungry, but there's not any extra oil. People show up thirsty, but there's no extra oil. I don't want to be a church like that. Anybody else? As far as I can tell, the tragedy of this story is there was no extra. That was the tragedy. Can I give you some good news, though? No? I can leave you here. No, the good news is we can leave with extra. I need you to look at me today. God will give you extra vision. We serve a God will give you extra faith. He'll give you extra mercy. He'll give you extra grace. You don't understand, Mark, I failed over and over again. No, you don't understand, God's better at healing than you are at destroying. God's better at redeeming than you are at, dest at destruction. God's better at forgiving you than you are at ruining things. And here's what I got good news today. There's extra vision. 
This church is going to have extra faith. We're going to have extra worship. We're going to have extra prayer. We're going to go from empty to extra. If you believe it, shout amen. Amen. I'm leading, I'm preaching, I'm believing that we're going to be a church with extra. John 6 says that Jesus does a miracle, feeds 5,000 hungry people. And after he does, he says, disciples, pick up the leftover baskets. There was 12 baskets full of extra. We serve the God of extra. He tells them to throw their nets on the other side. They start sinking the ship because of how many fish came into that net. We serve a God that's extra. 2 Kings 4 says the jars of oil continue to get filled up with extra. As long as there was jars, there was extra oil. We serve a God of extra. John chapter 2, the first miracle of Jesus is he turns water to wine. Six jugs, gallons of water, more than what was needed because we serve the God of extra. I was thinking about this, Stephen, at the end of his life. He's getting stoned, not recreationally. I know we're in California. He's getting stoned in Acts chapter 7. His enemies are throwing rocks at him. Can you imagine being so full of God that when people are killing you, you're asking God to forgive them? How full was Stephen that he had so much oil that even his enemies couldn't get him to curse them? He was full of extra oil. And I thought about this in Luke 15. You still with me today? The band can finish this up here. I'll wrap this up. In Luke chapter 15, it says that there was a son that went crazy, went to Vegas, stayed at the Venetian presidential suite, was doing high, high rollers, uh, slot machines, rented women of the night, lived wild, had lines of cocaine, had a bunch of methamphetamine, smoking like a chimney, drinking like a fish and every other annoying metaphor that a preacher would use. And it says that when he ran out of money, so did his friends. And when his friends left, he had no opportunities, he had no hope and no future. So you know what he did? He went into survival mode. He started going on the strip, started begging, started asking people for money. Pretty soon a guy said, you can work in my my backyard feeding my animals. He ended up in the backyard feeding a bunch of pigs. And he got so hungry that all of a sudden the pig food looked appetizing. Now some of you don't think that's possible because you've never fasted. But I promise you, if you're really spiritual and you fast, you'll actually experience a hunger that'll make trash smell good. And he got so hungry that the trash smelled good. Some of you today, I can feel it in this room right now. There's an anointing you're ready to help you out. Because you're so hungry that the trash in your life smells good. And this guy got to that point, rock bottom. And you know what he says? Luke chapter 15, he has this epiphany. And he says, he was sitting there and he had this revelation. He said, how many of my father's servants have extra? Extra food. Extra bread. And I'm in this pen with a bunch of pigs starving to death. Do you know what got the prodigal son to come home? It was extra. Do you know what's going to bring your kids back to God? I promise you it's not a church with no oil. I promise you it's a church that's on fire. I promise you it's a people group that say, you know what, we want everything that Jesus Christ died to give us. Come on, someone shout extra. We got to be a church that wants everything that God wants to give us. Isaiah 10, as the band starts playing, Isaiah 10, it says this, the anointing breaks what? Do you know what most churches don't, 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 don't reach these people that are in the famine? It's because there's no anointing. Listen to me, if you go to a church, people don't get saved, people don't get healed, people don't get delivered. I would say there's maybe no anointing present. I'm telling you that if all you do in church is teach, you'll have smart Christians. If all you do in church is sing, you'll have some good singers in your church. All you do is pray, you'll have some people that know how to pray in your church. All you do is hit the streets and evangelize, you'll have a bunch of evangelists in your church. But I'm persuaded that if we'll be a people group that says, Holy Spirit, we want your oil to flow through our lives. I want his anointing. I want to remind you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus got out of the grave. He gave hell a bad day. He gave the devil a black eye. He gave demons a nervous breakdown. He split the ground. The rock broke in half. 
Bible says that those that were dead rose out of the grave. There was a great earthquake. There was a darkness in the land. And it says that on the third day when he rose up that day, that he took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He led captivity captive. And here's what we know. He ascended on high. He revealed himself for 40 days. 500 people were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. And after he left, you don't got, you don't got my attention about this? I didn't think about this until two weeks ago. I thought if I followed Jesus Christ for three and a half years, I saw his miracles, I heard his teaching. He was such a good teacher, people forgot they were hungry for three days at a time. I've never heard anybody teach that good. He was so powerful, the dead came back to life. He had authority to tell the, the wind to shut up. And it listened. Do you know why we never read about people that were demon-possessed getting exercised or exorcist? Getting evicted? Because before Jesus Christ came to the earth, no one had the authority to do it. Listen to me. He was more powerful than anyone that's ever lived. And I thought to myself, if I was one of the 11 or 12 young men that followed him, do you know what it would have, it would have recorded in the book of Acts? It would have said, Mark, one of the disciples of Jesus, was sad for three years. And he cried every day that Jesus was no longer with them. Do you know what got my attention this last couple weeks? Is there's nowhere in scripture that the disciples were mourning. Why wouldn't you be sad if you were physically with Jesus Christ for three years? Why is there no like Debbie Downer, let's mourn for six months? The Bible records in the Old Testament that when a king died, the entire land mourned. When, when Israel died, everyone in Egypt mourned. So why would the world not mourn the king being crucified? Two reasons, you ready for them? Number one, because he's no longer dead. That's why they didn't mourn. I wish that I get a better response than that thought today. They didn't mourn because there was no one to mourn. He's alive. And you know why I didn't mourn number two? Because he said, the moment I leave my spirit, my oil, my oil, my oil is going to fill your life. And it's going to feel like I never left because I haven't. Do you know why most Christians, they're mourning? Because they don't know he's still alive or they don't know that his oil can fill him up today. I never want to stand to your feet. I feel his oil come in this room. And when the oil begins to flow, the Spirit of God begins to move. It's not weird, but I'm telling you, it is powerful. His, his presence will heal your addiction. It'll cure a disease. It'll remove the guilt and shame some of you've been living under. Man, some of you walked in here so heavy today. Suicidal. Someone came in with no hope. You know what you need? You need His presence today. And listen to me. Very important. Last part of my message is I'm telling you that if you wait until he returns, it's too late. It says they all slept, but the closer he got, they had to make sure they were ready. And I tell you today before everybody in Orange County, everybody watching online, that there is no other day guaranteed to get filled up in your lamp. No other future day promised to you. The only moment we know we have for certain is this moment. And that's why I would plead with you as your pastor, I would plead with you as a preacher, to say don't let today get away from you without filling up your lamp with his oil. Some of you are going to knock on the door one day and say, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I never knew you. What do you mean he never knew you? You ever thought about that? How could God say he never knew us? He made us. He knows our personality. He knows how many hairs are on our head. So why would he say, I never knew you? It wasn't that he didn't know you, is that you never knew him. How could a good God send people to hell? How could the world not want a good God? That's my question. And by the way, God doesn't send anybody to hell. He honors their decision of what they do with their lamp. You can live empty the rest of your life. You can use your lamp for recreational fire. You can have your own man-made fire. You can worship the Rams. You can worship the Raiders. You can do whatever you want to do with your lamp. But I'm telling you, there's only one oil that will satisfy. There's only one oil that will make your lamp burn, burn, burn bright. We don't serve a God of barely. We serve a God of extra. 
I'm telling you today that I don't, I don't pray to Jehovah Jireh, Je Jehovah barely. I don't pray to Jehovah broke. He is Jehovah Jireh. He's beyond that. He's El Shaddai. He's the all-sufficient one. He's the God that is more than enough. And I want to prophesy over you that this is going to be a season of extra. You're going to forgive with extra grace. You're going to receive forgiveness with extra. You're going to give with extra. You're going to love with extra. You're going to worship with extra. We're going to pray with extra. Does anybody in here feel what I'm saying today? I want all that Jesus died to give me. Lord, fill me up with extra. I want to pray for three things today. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. The foolish Christian is those that live without his oil. And I want to pray this today. If you feel like Mark, honestly, if I'm being really transparent in this church, I'm not living my life for Jesus Christ. Maybe you got burned by religion. Maybe you grew up with God and walked away, college, high school. Maybe you've been living for the devil for the last 10 years of your life. I got good news today that this is a room full of grace. We got extra mercy in this room. If you're here today and you want to get right with Jesus Christ, why would you wait to the end of your life to do something you can do today? And listen to me. If God isn't good enough to live for now, He's not good enough to live for later. He's either worthy of all of our life or none of our life. But this garbage of waiting until you're on your deathbed to surrender to Jesus Christ, I can't stand that logic. If God is God, He's worthy of our best. I'm going to give Him the best years of my life. I'm going to worship Him while I'm young before I need a lot of Botox. Come on. I want to worship while I'm young. I'm not going to wait till I'm old and give my leftovers. I want to give Him my extra. You guys hear me today? Eyes closed. Holy moment. I'm going to ask you an honest question. If you died today, you're like, I have no idea what would happen to me eternally. Why would you be so careless? That's reckless. Make up your mind today that I'm going to live my life knowing God and that when this life is over, I'm going to spend eternity with God. Eternity is too long to be reckless with. You say, Mark, if I can know Jesus Christ, if I can rededicate my life to Him, I walked away. Whether you've never known Him as your Lord or you used to, but you walked away and you want to rededicate your life, I'm going to ask everybody, count of three, to raise your hands. Close your eyes. You say, Mark, I want to give my life back to Jesus. Or for the first time, I want to put my faith in Christ Jesus. One, all over the room. Two, today's the day, today is the day of salvation. I want you real high right now. Just right. Three, raise your hand real high, real high, real high. That's me. I want to rededicate. I want to come home today. I want to come home today. I want to, there's extra oil for you. Come on, there's extra oil. Keep it up. I see hands all over the room. One, two, real high, real high. Three, real high, real high. Four, thank you, real high. Five, six, seven, eight. Real high, real high. I see eight hands. I see eight hands, nine hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? Awesome. Pray this prayer, Ocean. Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you today to fill me up with your oil, your presence, your spirit. I'm asking today, forgive me. Turn me from darkness to your light. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. And here's our handlebars. You guys ready? Pray like this. Say, Lord, teach me to pray. Give me a love for your word. Give me a church to call home. And I ask for friends that know you can show me your ways. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. You prayed that prayer. Let's celebrate those nine or ten people today. Come on, give them a good hand clap. You're watching online to write heart, H-E-A-R-T, if you gave your life back to God today. Many online get saved every single week. I'm almost done. Before we finish up, I want to ask one more question. Stay standing with me. If you're here today and you say, Mark, I'll be honest. I love Jesus, but I'll be real. I think I'm more like the foolish than the wise. I don't feel like I'm living ready. I don't have extra oil right now. I feel like I'm running on empty. I don't feel like I'm living with expectation. I've been negative. I've been bored. I've been cynical. You want God today to, to remove that foolishness and make you wise by connecting with His Holy Spirit. People say, how do you connect with the Holy Spirit? It's by His presence. You say something like this, say, Holy Spirit, fill me up today. Fill my mind, my heart, my, my thoughts. Fill me up. If you want to stop being foolish and empty 
and you want to be wise and have extra. This is not, not shaming anybody, but I think if we're being honest, we could all use some extra today. Would you lift your hands if you want some extra? Holy Spirit, I ask that we this be a church full of extra. Saddest thing to happen is a, a dying world shows up to a church that doesn't have enough oil. God, give us oil so much that we have more than we need for our family, enough to give to others. I pray that you give us more faith than we need for our family, that we have more for others. More wisdom than we need that we can give to others. More resources that we need that we can give to others. I pray that we would be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord, fill me up today with extra. Extra vision, extra faith, extra love, extra hope, extra joy. Fill me up. Jesus' name. The last thing we do, Oceans, I feel His presence in here. If you need a healing in your body, you need a touch from God. I'm telling you, you came to a church that believes God for extra. He's going to heal today. We had a young man in our church get healed of lupus last Sunday. Documented. Documented. I'm not sure if he's in this service or not. But this young man was in second service or third service last week. Couldn't make it to the front for prayer at the end. But Rex and the team prayed, and it's crazy that this young man, after, I think he's had it for several, I don't know if it's months or years, but I know that he's lost 28 pounds. And he's been tested positive for lupus. He actually got touched on Sunday, last Sunday. After he got touched, he went home. He gained eight pounds back this week. They ran tests, and he tested negative for lupus. We serve a God that heals, ladies and gentlemen. This is not some fantasy, fairy tale prayer. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he doesn't just save your soul, he can heal your body. If you need a touch from God, I want you to lift your hands. I feel faith in this room today. Come on, we need prayer today. Come on, I'll raise my hand every time I need to raise it until God heals me. If that's you today, come on, find someone next to you. Come on, pray for Katie. Come on, pray for him, pray for Reed. Hands on him today, come on, say, Lord Jesus. Come on, like you mean it, say, Lord Jesus. You said, we lay hands on the sick, we lay hands on those in need, and you would heal. You would deliver. You would save. In Jesus Christ's name, we speak life, healing right now. Miracles, signs, wonders. In Jesus' name, we love you and we thank you. And all of God's kids that believe God said amen.